I'm Kimberly C. Palm. As I travel throughout each state, I realize that death is just a moment. It is how we live until that moment that matters. Finding connection with friends, family, and complete strangers. Journey with me. This is the Live Well, Die Well Tour. I can't believe we're actually talking on this podcast. You know, you're it's interesting when I tell people that I know Ken Ross and and then they talk about your mother, you know, Kubler Ross. It's 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 really interesting because your mom was such a pioneer in this field. It is. It's uh, you know, I lived through it, so I it's kind of, you know, you have a certain myopic view of it because you were in the <laughs> middle of the hurricane, but on the outside, you know, it, it had one impression on the inside, you know, I kind of saw <laughs> what it did. Um, but you know, through my own particular glasses, I guess it's kind of right. hard to describe. <laughs> I can only imagine what it would be like to be a child of hers. Cause she was traveling nonstop. Yeah. I mean, her calendar went out literally like two and a half years, every single week, you know, some weeks should be in four different cities. So it was, you know, and this be before the internet and cell phones. So, you know, it was pretty hardcore to travel like that back in the day when, you know, you'd lose communication with people for a long time. <laughs> so. Sure, sure. Now your mom, she has an accent. Yes, she was born in Zurich. So she is a Swiss hillbilly. So <laughs> she's she's definitely got that accent, which, you know, I hear it and yet I don't because, my friends would be like, what did she say? I'm like, didn't you hear her? She, went, <laughs> she, she said, do you want some patrost? <laughs> yeah. A little Germanic, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. Can it? So can, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, but she was, she was a fire starter, change maker. Um, she came over to the United States and was like, what are you guys doing? Yeah, she was small and feisty. <laughs> so, a lot, a lot in a small package. <laughs> so, yeah. How tall was she actually? She was really in, tiny. Exactly five foot tall, the same height as Mother Teresa. <laughs> I saw a picture really? of them together and they were exactly the same height, you know, with whatever shoes they were wearing, but <laughs> they were both not really shoe people. So I assume it was exact same height. <laughs> so, that is so can you tell me how how did you get your mother or looking back, how do you feel like your mother why did she become so passionate about end of life issues and and how did that affect you and what you're doing now because you're you're a renowned photographer but you also have your foot into this end of life world too yes. because of your mom's legacy I'm a legend in my own mind <laughs> <laughs> true <laughs> so um yeah i think my mom was just born to do this because you know even as a young girl 4 5 6 years old she was out in the forest trying to save animals. She'd bring home injured rabbits and birds and whatever she could find, and she would heal them. So, I mean, it was just in her DNA. And her whole family was very much like, you know, very take life by the horns and just really control it. Her sister, like, was the first senator, uh, female senator of Switzerland, you know. So that's a big deal, you know. And her other sister in her 80s was feeding homeless children in Nepal and crossing Africa by herself and, you know, on the church choir and the church uh, uh, playing the piano and the organ and doing cross-country skiing when she was 86 years old, you know. So, I mean, the whole family had these incredible genes. And so she was just born to this. Um, so, you know, as a young girl, she was always defending the underdog, whether it was animals or people being bullied in school. Wherever she went, she was always defending marginalized populations and the underdogs. So, you know, and then when she was a teenager after World War II ended, she went out to rebuild Europe. I mean, that's crazy as a teenager to hitchhike through war and torn Europe, through disease, starving people, you name it, sleeping in cemeteries so she wouldn't get raped at night. I mean, this woman was, you know, practically fearless. So she was always just born to like, you know, fight the fight, <laughs> fight the good fight. Holy cow. I mean, I guess whatever she decided to be passionate about, she did it with gusto. Oh, yeah. So when she wanted to be naughty, she was really naughty. <laughs> so, <laughs> so. Oh, man. So your mom has become 
a mentor to thousands of people who us who work in this field of those facing end of life and helping to evolve end of life. Yeah. What do you think is the most important, most understood thing of what she was trying to teach us? What, what was she ultimately trying to teach us when, for those that work at the bad side of the dying, but also for the patients and families to have a voice within this uh, choice? Uh, well, complicated answer, but of course, most misunderstood of course, is the five stages, <laughs> which we just sold this book in its 40th language after half a century. Holy cow. So the book is still going strong. It's in Indonesian, Arabic, Hebrew, Russian. I have like nine contracts going right now for her books just this month, you know. So, I mean, it still speaks to a huge audience. And um, it's know. the most misunderstood because her, her, yeah, talk to me about that because you, you, you tell that very, very well of what she was trying to do and how we, we, we just totally misunderstood. Right. Well, you know, I mean, the five stages, of course, you know, I mean, so much you can say about that alone. Um, you know, if you look in the book and let's see if I can find it quickly. Um, here it is. So if you look at, this is the actual book, I'm not making this up. You look at that I'm chart, I'm dying. you know, there's more than five stages, right? I mean, Elizabeth knew Grief is complex, and that's what she was trying to say. But ironically, she gets chastised for saying there's five stages. What she meant was that grief is made up of different parts. She is saying, basically, grief is complex, right? And then other people say, no, Elizabeth, grief is complex, so it can't be five stages. And she's saying, no, that's what I'm actually saying is that grief is made up of different things, not just the five stages. It's made up of hope, preparatory grief, partial denial, anticipatory grief. It's made up of shock. It's made up of anxiety. I mean, she talks about all these things in the book, but people just, uh, for whatever reason, get we stuck. get stuck on that. We oh, there are only stuck. five stages. Yeah. Let's work through them. Yeah, well, that's what we're talking I mean, about. Her grief is complex. <laughs> like, that's what she said. <laughs> I'm just like thinking about my own grief and I'm like on stage 551, you know, right. and it, it can, it, it, but I also think she opened the door for finally discussing that the state grief you do move through. Right. And, and and she was a master of getting people to get to some form. We won't say acceptance. Or, you know, people don't like that word, but she was a master in five, 10, 15 minutes. She get people to get through the grief like you wouldn't believe. I mean, you know, I saw these people and they're like, oh my God, your mother saved my life. I was suicidal. And then after your mother talked to me, it all made sense. Like, you know, I'm oh, still sad, wow. but I get it now, right? You know, they just, it's not acceptance in that kind of, you know, it's gone and forgotten mode, but it's like, okay, I can move my life forward now with some reasonable amount of participation and growth and, you know, understanding of the grief and that I'm never going to get past it, but I can live with it in a certain fashion. <clears throat> so she was trying to say like, you know, hey, there's a problem. We have to deal with it. Grief is complex. Uh, you know, talking to dying patients is about listening. It's not about projecting. It's not about your own counter-transference. It's about unconditional love. It's about challenging your own unfinished business, challenging your fears. You know, this book is, if you want to debate me or not, is the cornerstone of the hospice movement. I agree. The cornerstone of the palliative care movement, thanatology. I'm not saying she invented any of these, but this book is what broke it out and she was trying to build a bridge of language between doctors and patients where there was no common language. This book gave them a common language so we could begin a discussion. Ah, oh, I love it. Now, this is the interesting part is that you took took care of your mother at her end of life. That wasn't and challenging, was it? <laughs> I, I only, only had one heart attack. <laughs> You know, what was it like caring for an individual who like radically changed how many of us will face our end of life or has faced our end of life? And I mean, what was that like? I could only imagine. Yeah, you know, my mother was fiercely independent. So when she had her big stroke on Mother's Day after she moved down to Arizona, you know, she was pretty angry, you know, and <laughs> she had no trouble telling the press she was very angry. <laughs> so, right. um, so, you know, she had a staff of 13, 16 people and then it was me. And then I got a secretary, but it was still, you know, incredibly overwhelming. She had something like 86 publishers around the world. She had people showing up from around the world every single day. There was press. There was her, 
personal needs, her medical needs, you know, the, just everyone wanting permissions and taking from her and trying to cheat her. And, oh, you know, wow. I'd go to her house and her car is missing. Her rugs are missing. She's missing. <laughs> you know, people saying, oh, you know, I you went away for a week. I took care of your mother. Here's a bill for $10,000, you know, like, <gasps> hello, like you're the gardener. Why would I pay you $10,000? take care of my mom. Well, I gave her lunch for a week. I'm like, oh, okay. So, so what? You have got to be kidding. You know, it was just like an endless parade of lawsuits and craziness. And, you know, I mean, going, you know, the things that go along with fame that you don't really think about, you see the glamorous side, but there's also a very challenging, tough side that brings out, you know, the best, but also the worst of people. So I had to deal with all that. So, so it's not only taking care of your mother as in her later years, but it's all the minutia right. of trying to protect her. Yeah. And there's a lot of minutia that goes along with fame. <laughs> so, right. You know, and, and she would complain she was bored, but there would literally be a line of five, 10 people waiting to see her on certain days. Right. You know, <laughs> and there'd be, you know, there'd be movie stars, there'd be like royalty, there'd be uh, Buddhist priests. Uh, there's one woman who flew in from Tokyo just for tea from Tokyo, just for tea, she'd fly back the next morning, seven times she came out just to have tea with my mother from Tokyo. You know, so I mean, really intensely loyal people, <laughs> intensely bad people, and people who are psychotic and people who are like <laughs> suicidal. And, you know, yeah, it yeah. was a nonstop parade. <laughs> oh, wow. And so it wasn't just like, oh, well, let's go get my mom some Taco Bell. It was, you know, a very complex story which was interesting and amazing. And I saw beautiful things, but uh, it definitely wore me down some. <laughs> yeah, because you were a photographer traveling the world doing right. your own thing. Yeah, I had two parents who were doctors and all they talked about was death every evening at the dinner table. <laughs> and my father would bring home human brains, leave them in the kitchen. And I would have to go to my dad's hospital and pick up brains and take them to another hospital for him <laughs> or go into the morgue and he'd be doing a brain autopsy, which is really disgusting. <laughs> so, so, you know, I decided I have to live a really fun, engaging, interesting, crazy life. So I thought, wow, National Geographic photographer, that sounds like, you know, an amazing way to spend this short little time on the planet. And that way I get to see the whole world and I get to, you know, try to figure out what this life thing is. Well, and you just, you just happen to take one, you know, really good, freaking good pictures. I mean, you have an eye, my friend, you have a <laughs> beautiful, you, yeah. beautiful eye. Um, well, I think it expresses my love of life, my excitement of physically being here. Like, you know, I mean, yeah, I've heard a bazillion stories about life after death and all these people who died in accidents and things. And, all I know is I'm here today. I'm going to make today great, engaging, and I'm going to, you know, take away something from my little library of experiences today and every day and be a little crazy like my mother. And photography was a great vehicle because I was very shy, very quiet. And so I thought, oh, I could just kind of hide behind my camera and quietly take pictures and engage in the world and express my enthusiasm not verbally, but through my photography. And so I think it it shows. Oh, totally. It shows in such a beautiful way. Now, you are now the president of the Kubler-Ross Foundation. So talk to mm -hmm. me about what does that mean and what are you guys doing? <laughs> it's a mystery some days. <laughs> 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 I'm the orchestra director of chaos. <laughs> yeah, <I mean. laughs> um, We currently have, uh, let's see, I think we have 14 chapters. So we have 14 different chapters in 13 different countries right now. And we have, I think, seven countries lined up to become chapters and three more interested. We have interest from Israel, Mongolia, and Spain. And we're opening up Brazil North, Brazil East, Bolivia, Colombia. And these chapters, what does that mean? What does it mean? That's the good question. <laughs> if you can explain that to me, we'd be in great shape. <laughs> <laughs> so the foundation, um, we kind of continue my mom's legacy, and that means we either deal typically with hospice, palliative care, or grief support. And we do that to both professionals and to the people on the street, the layman, the people who need the work or the therapy or the counseling or whatever, or whatever have, you know, whatever they need, we kind of do it. So we try to support hospice. We try to create hospices. 
We try to train people to develop hospices. We connect people, collaborations, connections. We do it through advocacy, uh, resources, uh, developing these groups. <clears throat> and so we have you know dozens and dozens, dozens of projects all around the world. Um, right now, we're beginning to focus more on education, but you know every group does something a little bit different. <clears throat> so like in France, we do death cafes. Uh, in Brazil, we're starting the first freestanding hospice in the oh. worst slum of the entire city, which is not easy. <clears throat> um, wow. In Chile, we initiated the first pediatric hospice. Um, in Guatemala, we're building a house where women coming in to get chemo from the countryside normally have to take a bus all night because they don't have money for a hotel you know, they get chemo and they're exhausted and they're nauseous and they have to go back because they can't afford to stay in a hotel. We're building a respite center for these women who can come the day or two before, rest up, kind of get some understanding what the chemo will entail, get the chemo, they can come back, we'll take care of them until they're stable, and then they take a bus back to their villages, right? So it's a respite oh, center, wow. but it's, you know, it's in that area of my mother would just want to help these poor women who have to sleep on the street the night before they have chemo. It's just a horrible situation. Oh, my. Right? Oh, yes. We're working with the biggest, uh, oh, the oldest, rather, university in Central America to train palliative care doctors. Uh, we're working with St. Christopher's Hospice, named Cicely Saunders mm. Place in London. Absolutely. Uh, we're working with some projects with Stanford University, where we just gave all my mom's archives. Uh, we just built uh, a digital library of all my mom's things, uh, all her videos. So we're going to make that available in four or five languages next year. We're working with a group in Germany that did this thing called Suitcase for the Final Journey. journey rather. Um, <clears throat> so people take whatever they want to take with them into the next world, and they have one suitcase to put anything they want to take into their next lifetime. And so it's an interesting study of what people's values are and what they find important physically in this life. Wow. It but you know, you're a photographer. Yeah. But you're a photographer. And yeah. so your mom has <laughs> drug you right. perhaps, or no, but how, how are you, this must be something really interesting because you're, you, even though you were raised by two doctors who always talked about death and dying, which is an education in itself, it was Elizabeth Cooper Ross and your father. Mm -hmm. Um, but how, what is it like to continue your mom's legacy like this? You know, I, I, I wasn't part of it for many years, decades, but I traveled with her all the time. And I traveled with her to like 20 countries. So I saw numerous lectures, numerous workshops. I saw her counseling Eskimos in Alaska and Zulu witch doctors and you name it. You know, I was there watching her do her stuff and be sitting back quietly, but I kind of picked up on what she was doing and what her intentions were and a little bit of her methods and so forth. So... <clears throat> You know, I got the gist of what she was doing, even though I'm not a doctor, not a social worker, but I mean, I'm a human being. You're her I, son. <clears throat> I know what her intentions were to some degree and her philosophies and obviously I've read her books and sure, I got a sense of what she was doing. So, you know, when she, when she was dying, she said, Kenneth, you know, do what you want. You don't have to do my work. Just do whatever you just feels right, right? <laughs> so I'm like, well, you know, photography has been great. I feel like I kind of had this beautiful gifted life that was like five lifetimes worth of experience. But I think now it's time to like get into the hard work. I feel like I had my retirement and now I'm actually doing the work. <laughs> so oh, wow. it's very challenging, but very rewarding because, you know, there's only one Elizabeth <clears throat> and a lot of places still do not have this work. Oh, wow. You know, they don't have palliative care. They don't have hospice. They don't have social workers. They don't you know, they, don't, they have some palliative care, but it's not very developed. It's only for the rich. It's only in the cities, you know, or it's, they have it, but it's not what I'd call <clears throat> really a healthy scope of what the work is meant to be. Wow. So it really needs to be manipulated and move forward in what I would see as a healthy way, which of course I'm biased. So it's my mother's way. <laughs> right, right. Exactly. Now, a couple of years ago, we were in Arizona together. Um, first time I met you. And we 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 have a mutual friend or uh, my acquaintance, your friend. Um, but this acquaintance bought the movie rights to your mother's story. And so let's talk about where is that project? And, and tell me more about your friend. 
<laughs> um, well, this is one of my <clears throat> big thorns in my side. <laughs> I've been working on this project 22 years now, I think. <clears throat> and I don't know why there's not five movies because her life is so interesting. You know, HBO literally said her life is so complex. There, there's five movies and we don't know which movie to tell. So we're going to drop a project. <gasps> and they had four Academy Award winners on the team, including Susan Sarandon. And they said, it's just too complex. We just can't do it. And so then my friend Melina Kanakaridis took over <clears throat> about 11 years ago. And she used to go with me to my mom's farm in Virginia. She knows my mom, knows her intentions. You know, we trust her with the story. <clears throat> so, but she has found, which is just shocking, in the 21st century that she said directors and producers are scared to death to talk about death. Now, I, she says, I respond, well, what about all these movies that are about death? I mean, there's James Bond and all these spy movies and all, you know, people are dying and clouds, you know? But yeah. It's like, okay, well that's death, but it's like, you know, the fantasized movie version where you can't talk about honest death, you know, and my mom's story is not really about death. It's about hope and living and unconditional love. So <clears throat> she's found it very challenging. So Annette Benning was going to play my mom for a couple of years and then they kind of went a little bit differently with the script. Melina had one idea and Ed had another idea. So uh, now Jessica Chastain has it and she's interested. And now she wants to do a mini series. <gasps> wow. We also have a group in France that wants to do a TV series on her NDEs, the end, near death experiences. And we have a group in Germany that wants to make a feature film. So very complex. <laughs> so, yeah. So basically, I don't know where it is. <laughs> well, the thing is, she, I, the the thing with a movie, it it makes it more understandable. And you know, you're not going to be able to tell the multi facets of your mother's life, but her work has touched and shaped end of life as it is today. And it could be a great, inspiring movie about a five foot nothing who changed mm -hmm. how we are dying these days. Right. Yeah, a foreigner, you know, who was in America, who was a woman in the 60s, which, you know, that's a big deal. <clears throat> and, you know, which is interesting, her best friend was a six foot three African American priest who was a Black Panther, right? So, I mean, oh, think wow. of that in a movie. That's a, an amazing story for the 60s, right? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> imagine these two coming down the hallway. It's like, the original odd couple. But if anyone listens is listening to the podcast and you there there's been no done deals and so they need to call you if they're interested to possibly create more chaos in your life and let's get this movie built. Yeah, we yeah, need to get this done. Time. Amazing story, very inspirational and uh <clears throat> every time we think we're getting close, something happens. You know, so we've gotten close a bunch of times. Lily Taylor, I don't know if you know her, a wonderful actress wanted to buy the rights. Susan Day from the Partridge family. Oh, um, wow. Meryl Streep said more than anything else, she wants to play Elizabeth Kubler-Ross in a movie. So, I mean, there's <gasps> tons of interests, and yet we can't get the movie made. It's just so ironic. I don't know what it is. Meryl Streep would be phenomenal. Mm -hmm. She, I mean, she's a little tall, but still. Yeah, but she's got the accents down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she does. She does. So tell me this. How can people support the foundation um, other than picking a, a a funder to fund this movie um, so you can shoot it exactly the way you want to? But how can people support this foundation for to continue your mom's work? We even have funding, so even that's not a problem. So what? That's why it's you like have this funding? Mind no, it's like, what is the problem? It's like, amazing story. Tons of interest, money. Like, what's the problem? Like, it's just, I don't know. <clears throat> It'll happen when it's meant to happen, I guess, but it's frustrating. Yeah, I guess so. But it's just, I'm scratching my head right now. Yeah. Um, but to help the foundation, well, A, you can actually read this book on death and dying and see that there's more than five stages. So don't kind of just parrot these ridiculous, you know, grief experts who attack Elizabeth because they don't like the five stages or a stage theory or whatever issue they have with Elizabeth, like, you know, actually look and listen and feel what she was trying to communicate. Right. We, Absolutely. We don't blast Thomas Edison because he didn't go far enough with the light bulb. Do we? I mean, you know, no, no, I mean, right. Come on. Exactly. Come on now people like, even if you don't like the five stages, uh, what about hospice? What about palliative care? What about bioethics? What about, you know, 
all oh, these things yeah. that she yeah. helped launch. You can participate in our education programs. We're going to have four or five programs next year. We've got one going on now. We just had a, a seventh of 11 presentations today. And we're talking about making that available on a CD or in some kind of uh, package next year. You can volunteer to help one of our foreign groups if you speak Spanish or Portuguese or French or Japanese or Flemish or any of the places we operate. And uh, we're looking for a good assistant to handle the email and the Zoom classes. We're looking for a social media person. We're looking for a development person. Oh, wow. We're looking for doers, right? Right. You know, we got like a ton of brands on the board, um, but they're so successful. They're very busy with their own projects, which I totally get. They're wonderful references, um, but I need kind of help in the practical sense of day-to-day stuff. But we'll get there. We're moving forward. And, you know. And do you take volunteers as well? Um, I don't know what we do with a volunteer because basically we need someone who, to really dig deep and get an understanding because it's a very complex world. Sure. Of who all the players are and who all the groups are and, you know, the regulations and how they interface together and what my mother's, you know, life, death, and transition workshops were about and who were their staff. You know, it's it's very hard to keep all this together. There's at least like 200 different players and you have to know who's who and who's on the inner circle and, <laughs> you know, how does the publishing work and who's the who's our agent for that. And Wow. And then, yeah, not only are you doing all of this, but you're speaking, you're, you're doing, I see you all over social media being at summits and expos and yeah, you're there's, everywhere. There's copyright issues and trademark issues and licenses and permissions. And it's an interesting world. Now, do your um, foundation, can people give money to support your efforts? Oh, no, we hate money. We? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah. We would love that. I, we haven't been very assertive about asking for money yet um, because I felt I really wanted to have something behind us before we asked for money. And sure. now I feel like, okay, now... We have over 50 projects. I have no trouble asking for money because now we're really like in the trenches doing the work like all over the place. And where's the, what's the website where people can go to Kubler-Ross Foundation? The website is EKR, because people cannot spell Elizabeth or Kubler, (laughs) um, EKRfoundation.org. And you can go there, get your courses and, and learn more about what you're doing. Sign up for the courses. We have donation button, of course. We have some information. We're going to be growing the website next year. So we're looking for a great web designer who we can afford. Um, And then, of course, you know, we have something crazy like seven different Facebook accounts or nine. We have six or seven Instagram accounts. We have LinkedIn. We have Pinterest. You know, and I have to maintain all those to some degree or at least monitor them. Yeah. So it's a crazy. <laughs> so you need some up. help. Yes. But, you know, we have a great board. But again, you know, they're very busy, successful people <laughs> who are yeah, just geniuses. You need some doers. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, they do it when they can. But obviously, you know, they've got important projects that are also part of this wonderful conversation um, that are every bit as important or more important than us. So we don't want to take too much of their time either because. They're all big, wonderful pieces of this grand puzzle that we're all trying to be a part of. Yeah. And the, the key word is trying because it, right now during COVID and everything else, it is it is crazy. How did you get through COVID? You doing okay? Um, you know, I was a little crazy like my mom. I went to seven countries between January and March, including China, Brazil, Germany, France, all the hot spots, right? <laughs> Italy. Um and I, I literally left each of those continents the day before they closed. I was monitoring <gasps> the news. And then I've been home for six or seven months now, you know, trying to catch up on all this work. Um, I still got boxes of mail and I think I have 6,300 emails still. Oh, my God. But I just went to Guatemala last week, which was my 101st country. So I'm very excited about that. That was my goal, 101. Wow. And uh, met with our group down there that I had never actually met in person. And we're going to Don't you need someone to carry your suitcase? <laughs> I have a lot of volunteers. <laughs> so. I do. I'm, I, I, I will do it. You have, you have uh, another one because, oh okay. my gosh, you, <laughs> it is so amazing to hear everything that you're doing in the countries that you're now involved with. Yeah, I just learned that from my mom. Just like, keep climbing, keep climbing. Don't worry about falling. Just keep climbing. <laughs> you know? Exactly. 
worry about the end later. So <laughs> exactly. Well, Ken, I thank you so much for taking the time out and being with us today. I know you've got a big expo this weekend, and you're always uh, traveling. And I'm, I'm hoping that uh, you'll get the help you need. And, and please donate to this foundation. Help uh, this foundation continue the work of Elizabeth Kubler Ross. And talking to her son Ken Ross. Thanks for your time today. Thank you, Kimberly. I appreciate it. Thanks for joining us today. And remember, you're the designer. This podcast is produced by Jason Andre with Seven Season Films. If you're interested in telling your story via podcast, look him up.